Lord Jesus, you are good. There is no one more good than you. You are good in your essential being and you are good in your dealings with us. You would, of course, be good if you destroyed every sinner. And yet your goodness is seen in the lives of the unworthy, the sinful, the rebellious, your enemies. Even as your Father has dispensed sunshine and rain in, in kindness to an unbelieving world, to a rebellious world, to a world that does not care, you laid down your life as the good shepherd for us sheep who were astray, running far from you that we might come to you and know your goodness. For this we are forever indebted. And it is a, a debt of love and gratitude that we enjoy. We sing of your goodness. We praise you for your goodness. We thank you for your goodness. And now as we look to your word, we pray that you would be good again to us, O oh God that our hearts would be soft, that our eyes would be open, that you would use your word in us to accomplish your purposes for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray it, amen. You may be seated. This is our TES Sunday. It's where we reflect on what it means to be a church that is training pastors and missionaries and training pastors and missionaries in the context of the local church. TES stands for the Expositors Seminary. We are one of 12 churches joined together to this task. We might ask, why don't we send guys off to school somewhere to get their book learning? And you think about Tyler Azeltine, David Britton, Daniel Bruce, Scott Demarest, Chris Drent, Ben James, Jackson Kennedy, all taking classes this fall. Four men who have been studying in seminary not taking classes this semester, Josh Rosas, Matthew Schneider, Bobby Casillas, Jeremy Lehman, and two who, Lord willing, will be graduating this next May, Kyle Frazee and Steve Kovac. And with them in the struggle, in the arduous tasks, their wives and their children Why don't we send them away somewhere to get training? Selfishly, we just don't want to. We don't want to lose them. They're a vital part of the life of this church. Can you imagine if they were gone? Fundamentally, we believe in training shepherds in the church. Finding shepherds, growing shepherds, developing shepherds. You might be newer to Grace Bible Church. This might be new to you. How do we go about the task of raising up the next generation of pastors in our church? Where does the church find missionaries to send out? Is there a missionaries are us? Is there a Costco for pastors? Where do you find them in bulk? How do we as a church think about faithfully passing the baton, the baton of truth and the gospel? so that those things survive past our time, thrives beyond our generation? How do we see the gospel and the truth of God's word go beyond these walls? How will the church be multiplied in this valley and to the ends of the earth? Fundamentally, why do we have a seminary on our church campus? I wanna think about that question by considering, first of all this morning, the pastoral task. Consider the pastoral task. I know in this church you are aware of the labors of the elders in this church. It is sort of a colloquialism, a, a general idea in, in American culture. Uh, must be nice to be a pastor. You know, you work once a week, give a speech. Y you know that preaching is a subset of shepherding. And it might be visible. It, it might be the thing everybody's gathered for at a set time. But you also know, because you know the elders in this church, the the labors, you know the prayer, 
you know the diligence, you know the, the house to house and in public teaching and shepherding and discipleship, you know the private counsel, you know the study. And that is because as a church, you, you have gotten close to the elders. You, you have made the pastors your friends. They're not some elite core untouchable somewhere that nobody really knows who they are. But you've had meals with them. You've recreated with them, gone on vacations with them. You've lived lives with them. You've been in small groups with them. You thankfully treat the pastors of this church as sheep and people. It's refreshing because you know them, you, you know their hearts, you know some of the burdens they carry. And I just wanna highlight the, the task of shepherding from several select passages of scripture. Turn first to Ephesians chapter four, and I put the list of these up on the slide. They're also available on the notes on the web you can look at. In Ephesians 4.11, we read from the pen of the apostle Paul that Jesus gave to the church. Some offices, some of those were foundational in the first generation only, apostles and prophets, uh, perhaps evangelists, if that was a miraculous first generation uh, office. But then this last category, some as pastor teachers, there should be a hyphen there, not an and, uh, that is describing one office. But why does God give pastor teachers, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints? Saints aren't dead, famous, medieval people who did some miracle. Saints just means Christians. Born again people, set apart ones unto the Lord. Pastors are given by Jesus to the church for the equipping of Christians for the work of service, for ministry. To what end? To the building up of the body of Christ, the church. What are pastors for? Oh, to do the ministry in the church? That's not the right answer. Pastors are there to equip Christians to do the ministry of the church. The church is a living organism composed of many parts, variously gifted, variously composed. Everybody's different and placed by the Holy Spirit in the church for the building up of the whole. And the great pastoral task is helping Christians be the church, biblically. This isn't a spectator sport. This is a participatory endeavor of interdependent parts. In fact, when one part is muted, or insufficient, it, it mutes the whole, it stunts the growth of the whole. That is one great aspect of a pastor's task, equipping the saints. Turn to Colossians chapter one. Burden for the elders in this church. Colossians 1.28. This is the no one left behind verse. We proclaim Jesus, admonishing, notice this, every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. And none of us in this room are yet complete in Christ and so this is a never-ending task. In fact, a, an impossible burden and yet the one at which we aim. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews 13, 17, we get another glimpse of the pastoral task. The author to Hebrews says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Notice this, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. That's heavy, that's weighty. Pastoral task is to oversee, to, to watch, to give soul care, accountable soul care. Pastoral task is, a, is the weighty one that answers to God for every man complete in Christ and for the equipping of the saints and for the well-being at a spiritual level of everyone in the church who's adequate for these things. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts 
I'll read verses 28 through 35. Paul is speaking here to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That summarizes pastoral heart and task. And I only read verses 28 to 35. I want to just by bullet point summarize all of the pastoral modeling here from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. Paul gave the church at Ephesus his own personal presence, verse 18. He did so as a slave of Jesus, verse 19. He did so with humility and tears and trials, verse 19. He did so with courage, verse 20. He declared everything that was profitable, verse 20. He taught publicly and personally, verse 20. He was involved in indiscriminate evangelism, whoever would listen, verse 21. He did so at great personal risk and cost, verses 22 to 23. He was singular and selfless in his aiming at the gospel, verse 24, and he declared the whole counsel of God's word, held nothing back, verse 27. His instruction to the elders at Ephesus, notice the plural there, there are multiple elders, this is God's design, of qualified men in a single church, and the instructions he gave to them, watch over the elders, verse 28. Watch over the flock, verse 28. Shepherd as Holy Spirit appointed overseers, verse 28. Beware of wolves, verse 29. And then, verse 30, beware of wolves even amongst the elders, potentially. Following verse 30, we get Paul's own model and his own example. Three years of relentless admonition and affection for the church at Ephesus, verse 31. He trusted the men who led the church with the church and entrusted them to the Lord. I commend you to the Lord and to the word of his grace. And then verses 33 to 35 finishes out the chapter telling us that Paul was selfless. He was not in ministry as a mercenary, as a hired hand, and he wasn't greedy. It's clear that his words and his life were in harmony because the elders at Ephesus were clearly moved. They gathered around Paul at the beach at Miletus here in this scene, and they wept on his neck. They prayed, and they grieved. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Another window into the pastoral task in the first four verses of this chapter. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, and the word elder um, is synonymous in office with overseer, pastor, shepherd. Those are four titles for the same office. I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. What is the pastoral task in these four verses? Shepherd the flock, verse two. Do so in proximity with them. You can't be an academic egghead removed from people. You have to be in proximity to sheep, verse two. And you do so as exercising oversight, verse 2. You do so willingly, verse 2, motivated by and for God, literally according to the standard of God in verse 2. Again, not for money, but eagerly. And then in verse 3, not lording it, not using authority as a sledgehammer over people to get what you want so that you get your preferences, but leading by example, verse 3. And then as a steward, not the owner of the church, whose sheep 
are the flock of God. They belong to Christ. He is the chief shepherd. Any pastor is an under-shepherd. And then to do so, looking forward to reward and accountability. There's a future vision to these things for pastors. We could move on to the pastoral epistles, and, and we won't read 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, those three letters written to pastors. You remember that in 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul told Timothy, I'm writing this to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the church, which is the household of faith and the pillar and support of the truth. It's something of an instruction manual for how to do church. I will summarize the commands to pastors. Protect God's people from false teaching. The, I can give you the references if you want the references. I'll skip those for now. Pray for government leaders. Instruct women. Put in place qualified elders and deacons. Point out bad teaching. Read the word publicly. Exhort and teach. Confront sin. Care for widows. Ordain some for service. Instruct slaves. Instruct the rich. Cling to truth and faith and love in Christ. Disciple men. Rehearse the gospel. Teach holy living. Refute and correct false teaching. Detect wolves amongst the sheep. Prepare God's people for persecution. Continue to teach, reprove, correct, and train with the God-breathed word. Preach the word. Do the work of evangelism. Appoint qualified leadership. Silence rebellious men and false teachers. Speak sound doctrine. Instruct men and women. Encourage godly living. Rehearse the gospel and its effects. Teach God's people to submit to the authorities over them. Avoid foolish controversies. Reject factious people. Encourage God's people to meet pressing needs. All of those are the pastoral tasks given in those pastoral letters. And of course, we could add to this all the commands of the New Testament. What does it look like for a New Testament era believer to live faithfully under God, to obey all the commands, to follow all of the prohibitions, and what is the pastor's task in those things? Again, to shepherd the flock, giving oversight and being examples in and among the flock which belongs to God. Listen, the pastoral task is ecclesiological. It is, it is about the church, the church which is precious to Christ. How could a man who does not love the church possibly be ready to serve the church, lead the church with the weighty responsibilities we've just read. This is part of the answer to why pastoral training ought to be done in the church. I mean, where do you find such men? Where do you find such men who gravitate to these weighty tasks? But in the church. They don't grow on trees, but they do grow somewhere. They grow in healthy churches. Therefore, we ought to be training men in the church. Who should train for a life of pastoral ministry? Men who love the church and who know what it is. And who should train men for such ministry? Men who love the church and know what it is. Let me give a second answer to this question. And in addition to considering the pastoral task, let's consider for a moment the missionary task. Why should we train missionaries in the local church? Sometimes when we think about missions, uh, we can think of any number of things. You might think about evangelism. Evangelism is critical to missions. If you go where people don't know the gospel, what should you be doing? Heralding the gospel, making the gospel known. And missions sometimes get distracted with a lot of other things. We need to be gospel heralds. We need to send people who know the gospel, who share the gospel before we send them, and then entrust them with sharing the gospel in another place where it's not known. But like preaching is a subset of pastoral ministry, evangelism is a subset of missionary activity. The mission of Christ the Great Commission uh, that began on the mountain in Matthew 28 and culminates in Revelation chapter 5 with people from every tongue and tribe and nation surrounding the throne of the Lamb is accomplished through the vehicle or the institution which Jesus ordained for that purpose. He said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then the New Testament lays out for us what that church is to look like. Local assemblies, 
multiplying, scattering until the work is done. All according to the template which God laid out. This is how Jesus is establishing and finishing his work. What is the missionary task? It is the establishment and strengthening of local churches. Missions is how this church got here. And the, missions, the mission isn't done. And so this church must multiply. Churches need significant help out there in the world. And there are whole swaths of people for whom there is no church at all. That essentially is what missions is. What does it mean to go do missions? It means to be ecclesiological. Maybe you're new around Grace Bible Church. If you've been around here long, you know that when we talk about missions, we're simply talking about the church in expansion. When we talk about church history, we're talking about the Great Commission in expansion. You've probably heard Joel James say, missions is the local church with a passport. The church is God's blueprint for taking the gospel to every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. Sometimes people have thought missions is what you do over there, church is what you do here. The reality is, here we need to think more missiologically, not just comfortable with who we are and, and what we're doing now, but always aiming at expansion, multiplication. And missionaries over there need to think ecclesiologically. What's our task when we get over there? Establish churches, strengthen churches, see that churches multiply and go even beyond the mission in view. Missionaries must be thinking, planning, endeavoring to see the church established and strengthened where it does not yet thrive. Missions is ecclesiological. Evangelism, discipleship, leadership development, Bible translation, support roles, all of them must have the goal of a body of believers conforming to the New Testament pattern, a church. Self-sustaining, reproducing, with qualified leaders and resources to take the gospel even beyond. Missions is church planting. So where should we be getting missionaries? In the church. Where should we be growing missionaries? In the church. They need to be trained in the church. How could a man who does not love the church possibly be ready to plant a church given the weighty responsibilities we've just read about? A church planter needs to know and love the New Testament model church. A church planter needs to know what qualified leadership looks like. He needs to be able to model it, teach it, identify it, cultivate it. A church planter needs to know how to preach if he is to develop men who will be preaching in their own contexts. A church planter needs to be a shepherd if he is to identify and train men with shepherds' hearts to give soul care in their own contexts. A church planter needs to know his Bible if he is going to impart and entrust the whole counsel of God's word to a generation of Christians in a foreign land. And a church planter needs to be an exegete, that is, skilled at rightly dividing the word of God if he's gonna be involved in Bible translation, teaching, teaching others to teach, all the tasks of missions. And frankly, the missionary task has many more challenges than a pastoral ministry context here. Have you ever thought about this? Add all that we've said about pastoral ministry into the basket of what missions must be, and then add to that another language, another culture, a different worldview, totally different way of thinking about things, vast expenses, and uprooting your family from what is normal and comfortable and easy, and planting them where it is immensely difficult and different. There are dangers. There is distance and isolation, and oftentimes a missionary is starting from scratch taking a, a land of unregenerate people with no church background, maybe no Bible in their language, who have never heard the gospel and maybe never even met someone who knows the gospel, a land where people speak differently, think differently, live differently. You and they may never have understood each other and maybe you never will in your entire missionary endeavor and you are to go to that land of people with the aim of producing a mature, self-sustaining, reproducing local church. It is an immensely more difficult task than the task of church strengthening in our own culture, in our own land. 
Where do you find such men? Does the stork drop them off? (laughs) Is there a missionary surplus store? Can they just like travel through and we give them some money? (laughs) That's happened sometimes. We want to train missionaries. What character and what equipment are needed for a lifetime of enduring faithfulness? Those are the next questions we'll tackle in in answering the question, why do we have a seminary on our campus? Let's think about the character first for enduring faithful ministry. What does it take to, to run long and to run straight? It means training well, being thoroughly equipped for the good work. And we'll start with the character. What is the character that is required for enduring faithful ministry, pastoral ministry, missions, First of all, it is a life under scrutiny. A qualified man is one who is to be above reproach. And in a very real sense, being above reproach is in the eyes of the beholder, to the outside world, to those in the church, to those under shepherding care. We read 1 Peter 5, and and we got a, a glimpse there of a shepherd's heart and practice. And in those pastoral letters, we get lists of objectifiable qualifications. I'll just read the two lists. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires. Uh, This goes back to not doing ministry under compulsion, but willingly. Um, And notice that a man may aspire to the office of an overseer, elder, pastor, and it is a work he desires. Uh, That's not an aspiration to a platform, uh, notoriety, recognition, fame, any of those things, it is an aspiration to a labor. An overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money, managing his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. If a man does not know how to manage his household, how will he take care of the church of God? not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil, and with a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The second list in Titus 1, above reproach, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. The overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. A man has to be a shepherd over his own heart. He has to be a shepherd in his own home, in his close relationships, before he can be a shepherd of others in the church. What is the equipment needed for a lifelong, enduring, faithful ministry? For pastors, for those we would send to places with no church, no gospel, no Bible. They need to train well to run long and run straight. A man needs tools to be a lifelong student of the Word of God. Listen, you don't go to seminary and get the answers. And for those of you in seminary, I'm apologizing to you now. If you've thought, I'll have the answers by the time I graduate, you're not. You're gonna have the tools to do the spade work of a lifetime as a student of God's Word. For a lifetime of work, uh, chipping away at the immaturities of your own character for a lifetime of work exploring the depths of the riches of the knowledge of God to be dispensed to God's people. In seminary, you will get the tools that you need for a life of faithful ministry, for a lifelong disciple relationship to Jesus Christ, a lifelong learner, and a lifelong servant of his bride, the church. So what must seminary give you? What must pastoral training give? Well, there must be academic rigor. There must be the the rigorous attention to the tools required for rightly dividing the Word of God, for rightly understanding, for cutting it straight. 
A man has to know the Old Testament and the New Testament, have a thorough knowledge of the Bible. And a man for a lifetime of ministry in our day needs to have the knowledge of the Bible in the original languages. At some level, if if a man only has access to the Bible in, say, English, he will always be dependent on others. You know, the, the early bird gets the worm. Unless you're a baby bird, and then you get the regurgitated worm from mom, right? There's a sense in which if you are going to give your life to teaching God's word and, and the whole counsel of God's word and shepherding God's people, there has to be a rigorous access to the truth of God's word as written. It, it means there's some extra work for us who did not grow up speaking Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek. The seminary provides the academic rigor of learning the original languages the Bible was written in and then doing exegesis, big fancy seminary word. It just means how do we get the meaning that God intended out of the text so that we're not putting our own meanings into the text so that the preacher, the proclaimer, the biblical counselor, the theologian, the missionary, the Bible translator is slave to God's word, not making God's word do what you want it to do takes a lot of work. And listen, the original language rigor that is pressed in our pastoral training is like the spinal column of everything else that the men get. And what I mean by that is we do our theology not by reading the coolest guys in history and finding out what did they say the answers were. We do our theology by what the Bible means by what it says. When we do the discipline of church history, we, we're looking back at where the church has succeeded and failed. What lessons can we learn? Uh, who can we look to as, as exemplary in church history? But we do all of that through the filter of exegesis. That is, what does the Bible say about how doctrines are to be held? And where did the church rise and fall? Did it meet the standards of the template of the New Testament? But we're not particularly interested in the, the train of human traditions as much as how did those traditions and histories line up with the Word of God? When we do the discipline of biblical counseling, the, the, the task is, what does the Bible say? What does God say? And how does that apply to the human heart? Now, there are many tools and resources from those who have been exegetes and shepherds and have cared for people, and we get to glean the benefits of what they've thought about when it comes to anxiety or any of the other issues that biblical counseling may address. But how much better equipped if a man is not regurgitating answers, but owning them from the scriptures? It's the shepherd's task. You think about all the disciplines that happen in a seminary education, they, they all flow out of this spinal column of exegesis. A man knowing his Bible and being governed by his Bible. It shapes your pastoral ministry. It shapes your evangelism and your missions. It shapes how and why you do corporate gathering and music. It shapes how you do your counseling. It shapes your theology. You're not free to just have big, deep thoughts about God with other people having big, deep thoughts about God. You are tethered to the Word of God in his own self-disclosure. This is critical. I know it's, for many who have gone to seminary, many who aim at seminary, and even amongst seminaries in our day, the, some of the thought has been, well, you gotta learn the languages, it's sort of a rite of passage, check off the box, get it done. Um, you, you need to prove that you can uh, work hard and think at something. It's, it's like the reason you did geometry in junior high. Do you remember that? Um, you who are studying geometry now, close your ears. You, you need it for life. But the rest of us, after the fact, are going, why did I do that? Just to make sure my brain could do stuff like that. Unless you're in an industry that still uses Euclid. The languages aren't like that. You don't study Greek just to get it done. You study Greek to know the word of God so that you know the God of the word so that you can bank your life and your ministry on what he has said and to do so with a precision and accuracy that the ministry demands. The academic rigor that we press 
on the men in, in the training here closes out with apologetics. If you've heard the word apologetics, it kind of sounds like the word apology. I'm so sorry I'm a Christian. Let me explain it. Uh, sometimes it refers to the defense of the faith. You know, um, When we talk about apologetics, what we mean is God is sovereign and God saves sinners and man is helpless, hopeless, spiritually dead without the supernatural work of God. What we mean by apologetics is the doctrines of grace applied to life and ministry. And if you think doctrines of grace and you're thinking about a flower with an acronym, tulip, you can work your way through those. Um, man is sinful, totally depraved. And without the supernatural working of God, he will forever be a slave of sin and dead in his transgressions. What's the bottom line? If he is to be alive, God has to take the initiative. And that's done in eternity past in election. God knows, foreknows, foreloves, and calls people to himself. And then God sent his son in the person of Jesus Christ. You think about the atonement, you think about propitiation. Jesus laid down his life for his sheep to actually secure them for eternity. And then the Holy Spirit effectually draws people to himself to believe the gospel. And if you're a Christian here today, you're a Christian because God's Holy Spirit made you alive. And God seals the deal and secures you by the blood of his Son and by the sealing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, salvation of sinners is God's work through and through from beginning to end. The implications of that for how one does church or missions are staggering. Some people have said, why would you ever do evangelism if God is sovereign in salvation? And it's funny that, you know, the uh, missionaries that went out from Europe and the great missions movement, William Carey and following, asked the opposite question, how could I ever go to the nations if God weren't sovereign? Because Christ had secured people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people by his own blood. And the means by which they would show up in heaven is the missionaries going out. They went out with that confidence. And, and ministry is that way. It, it frees us up from coming up with pragmatic human solutions to deep spiritual problems. We don't make this up as we go. Actually, God has given us the script for what to say, how to say it, how to do ministry. And listen, humans can be innovators. We like to come up with some newfangled thing, some new way to do something, uh, some idea. We're entrepreneurs. God has already laid out the script. The task for ministry is fidelity to God's message and his methods. And when we talk about apologetics around the seminary, that's what we're talking about. God's business, God's way, to quote Dr. George Zemeck. That is the academic rigor involved in the classroom. The bottom line is our message and message must, methods must be God-centered, God-dependent, and God-glorifying. What environment is suited to the task of equipping missionaries? What environment is suited to the task of equipping pastors if the pastoral task and the pastoral and the missionary task are as great as we've said? Listen, they can't be given the tools by book work alone. Men who will serve faithfully for a lifetime of ministry cannot be given mere academics. They must be given tools for study. They must be given heaps of knowledge. There is a, de a deposition of entrusted truth, but their character must also be forged. Forged on the anvil of trials and hardships, the personal discipleship of elders in the church. They must develop humble servant leadership. Their lives must be scrutinized and watched and corrected and helped. They must chip away at immaturities. And then natural pride must be humbled and educational pride must be humbled. Knowledge puffs up, we know that, it's axiomatic. And yet God loves knowledge. Fundamental definition of eternal life is the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Don't shy away from knowing stuff, just kill pride. We need humility with truth. 
And all of this requires the local church. Number one, because pastors should be training pastors. People who are training for missionary and pastoral endeavors need discipleship from elders who oversee various ministries in the church with their variety of gifts. And because you. You are the local church. Seminary students need discipleship from seasoned saints. By the way, let me, let me just encourage you, do not be intimidated by seminary students. They are learning to use big words. Sometimes big words get ahead of big hearts. Don't be intimidated by you, by them. They need you. They need your wisdom, your life experience. They need your diligent, faithful, step-by-step -step walk with Christ through life. They need to see the word of God applied over years of faithfulness in your varied circumstances. The seminary students have much to learn from you, church. Education and isolation makes desolation. You may have heard, have heard seminary referred to as cemetery. That's where big-hearted people with a spiritual pulse go to die. <laughs> it can happen. I want to press for you the uniqueness of the Expositor Seminary experience for our men. And, and I can say this as a, a perpetual student and as a participant in the training that you have a collection of pastors with a vision and passion and the equipping to dispense the necessary tools with the hearts of shepherds to forge character. Significantly, all of them are pastoring in local churches. They are not academics teaching theory from ivory towers. They are involved in real lives, pouring out their lives for real people that God cares about, seeking to extend God's care to God's people according to God's blueprint. Out in the hallway, you can see the banner with the locations of the TES churches. Those are all local churches. And you can see the faces of the pastors whose task it is to train men on those campuses. What's great about seminary in the church? Well, for students here on this campus in the Expositor Seminary, I think what's great is the scholarship. It is uh, more rigorous than just about anything out there. We are in a day where seminaries are moving away from original language training. That's a, that's a tragedy. Um, and, and the academic rigor here is tough, brutal, challenging. It's hard. And it should be. We want it to stay that way. The other thing that's great about seminary here on this campus and on all of the 12 campuses is mentorship that the seminary students are up under the lives of those who care about them and want to replicate what they're doing. And then an apprenticeship, which means seminary students are involved in ministry. You'll see them teaching, leading small groups. Uh, you'll see them uh, teaching Bible studies, serving in various capacities in the church. Um, there is a on-the-job training aspect uh, to this academic approach. And then fellowship, they're sheep part of the body of Christ. Um, their lives are intertwined with yours. Listen, if you wanna be a surgeon, you should learn surgery from surgeons who actually surge. That's probably not the right verb, sorry. If you wanna learn shepherding, you probably should learn from shepherds. Not academic, isolated, unaccountable book work, but from pastors who week in, week out, carry out the responsibilities of actually caring for people in real life. The great part about seminary in this church is the church, it's you. This is a great environment. Your God-given gifts being used in the body of Christ, your love, your service, your fellowship, your lives laid down as sacrificial worship to God, gathering together to love one another, to be members of one another. Students are learning Greek and Hebrew, systematic theology, church history, missions, preaching, pastoral ministry in this context. In other words, they're, they're seeing at one level a, a church that is growing towards the things they need to be aiming at in ministry down the road. And this has several effects. Number one, it instills in them a love for Christ's church. Secondly, it provides for them love from his church. They need to experience that. And thirdly, it gives them a template, a, a model to aim as they go out to plant a church or to strengthen a church or to serve a church in some context. 
And of course, we as a church benefit. The students aren't the only beneficiaries of this. The benefits of having a seminary in our campus as a church is we get equipped, we get sharpened by the students, we get to glean from their studies. They're often reading things that I've forgotten. They're reading things we haven't had access to. The conglomeration of churches together gives a cross-pollination of ideas and thoughts and awareness of what's going on in the evangelical world that is a benefit and a sharpening to all of us. There is a like-minded camaraderie amongst those churches. Those different churches in different locations are learning different things at different times, and then we as churches learn from one another and serve each other. And when you're traveling for work on vacation, you have 11 other places that will feel like home. Having a hand in God's developing a future generation of faithful pastors and missionaries is a tremendous privilege that every single one of you at Grace Bible Church has a part in. I would suggest it's also the responsibility of the church. If the church doesn't do these things, who will? If the church says, we don't want to train pastors and missionaries, well, who's going to do that? This is the role of the church. It is the responsibility, in addition to that, for pastors to train pastors. 2 Timothy 2.2 says, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The church has not always done this well. Sometimes it has ferreted out this responsibility to other institutions. It is a daunting responsibility with real challenges. You think about a a pastor with many responsibilities. Think about one pastor in a small church in a small town. How, How could he think about doing all of these things? How do I have time to train men when I have to fold the bulletins, play the organ, preach the sermons, care for all the people? Mary and Barry. The reality is, A pastor in a church must be about discipleship and training men at some level. Colossians 1.28, everyone complete in Christ. Part of that is identifying and cultivating servant leaders in the church so that he may pass the torch of biblical truth to faithful men who can pass the torch of biblical truth to faithful men who can pass the torch of biblical truth to faithful men who can pass the torch until Christ comes back. What's hard about doing seminary in the church? There are some challenges. One of the challenges is the stretch. Students are stretched by us. They, they don't just get to go to class. But they have to hang out with us. And we're people, and we sin. They experience that. And, and then seminary students stretch us as a church. I mean, they're sinners too. They're learning, they're growing. There are growing pains. As students that are learning to teach and preach and counsel and disciple, We as a church get the opportunity to graciously help them, provide a platform for them. It it requires for us patience, humility, a long view. You want to have a hand in God's development of a future generation of faithful pastors and missionaries. Being part of that requires love and patience. I know when I was a seminary student, there were some godly people in the church who put up with me. Some godly people with a lot of mileage in the Christian life who invested in me, provided a context for me to learn and grow and try. The other part about having a seminary in the church that's really hard is the goodbyes. We want to send the best. We don't want to send from us the people we'd rather be rid of. We want to send the people we think we can't do without. Think about our friends and fellow laborers to whom we've already said goodbye. You know, it's been over a year since Gilbert Bible Church planted. Tyler, with Josh, with Tom, and 150 of our friends. We sent our friends to Papua New Guinea, and 13 weeks from now, sent some friends to New Orleans. But this church has embraced these hardships as the necessaries of carrying on our bit of the Great Commission. 2 Timothy 2.2, and trust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That means identifying and developing faithfulness and then entrusting to men who prove to be faithful the truth that must be contended for, preserved, proclaimed, and lived out. And this task, their task, will be to do the same after us until Christ returns. Again, pray for these students as they start another semester, pray for their families, get to know them, ask them what they're learning, tell them what you're learning,
get involved in their lives. They need you, church, and we need them. A reminder about how to give, if you're thinking about giving to the Expositor Seminary, you can get on the church's website. Uh, there's a tab for giving. You can specify places you want to designate. Uh, one of those is the Expositor Seminary. If you click on that tab, it will give to the seminary, the, the 12 churches together conglomerate in, in a general way and meet those needs. Um, there are other tabs on there. Again, if you want to give to a student and help out tuition costs for a student on our campus, there's a tab to do that. And if you have in your heart the desire to buy books for a seminary student, here, there's a tab to do that as well. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the diligent labor of those who have taught us the gospel, of those who have opened your word from children's ministries to Sunday school classes to Bible colleges to seminary professors to faithful men and women who just took us by the side of the road and brought truths to bear. We thank you. Lord, we could never truly repay such a, an immense gift from you through those means. But if you would be pleased to make us instruments in your hands, fit for the continuation of this work, we would love that. Oh Lord, would you use us? Would you use this church to bring a multiplication of faithful local churches in this valley and to the ends of the earth? Would you use these precious saints in this church to pour into the lives of those who would train for lifetime of ministry in the church and where there are no churches yet? We ask it all for your glory, in Jesus' name.